Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dragon Talk. We are going to do a live recording, as we do every Monday, starting here at 2 p.m. As opposed to the dead recordings. The dead recordings. <laughs> yeah, when it goes straight to tape, that means it's, it's dead already. Uh, there's so many uh, uh, weird things that happen when you put things to tape. Um, we are going to do uh, two Laurie Should Know segments right up front here. That's why Mr. Perkins and Mr. Cernet are here joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about two fun things that they just said the, they were both here for the making of. So, so much mm-hmm. of so much of it goes back into the into the past uh, before their time, but this is all present time, at least for, for these gentlemen, so that's kind of cool. We're going to do the Shatter Kai and the Raven Queen. Uh, and then after that, we're going to do an interview with uh, uh, I mean, uh, Zalavier Nelson. I did it wrong again. You did it wrong. Z- Z- no, wait. No, that, I feel like that's wrong. That's, that's right? Zalavier Nelson Jr., uh, which I'm super excited to uh, uh, talk to him about and get his name incorrect uh, when we do the interview. Um, but he's a uh, 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 columnist and a uh, thinker, and I can't wait to ask him about uh, what he's doing with Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition uh, now and how he's playing and all that stuff. So we'll get to that interview uh, at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific Time, and then at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, we're talking to Adam Bradford and Todd Kenrick, uh, from D and D Beyond uh, and Curse Media, and excited to pick their brains about the current state of that uh, service and app uh, that they're that they've been testing and getting ready to go out there for you all. So that's super exciting. Uh, what do you guys have been up to? What did you how, did you guys have fun at uh, Emerald City Comic Con after our panel on Sunday? Yeah, any any excuse to get to downtown Seattle is nice. Nice treat. Yeah, I love that uh, yep. that video of the Good horse crowd. the horse drummer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Our room wasn't quite big enough to accommodate everybody who wanted to attend, so I feel a little bit bad about that. Um, and uh, But uh, everybody who was there asked lots of great questions, and we gave them not so great answers that they can <laughs> <laughs> do with what they will. My answers, my answers were the not great ones, were it, wasn't it? No. No, oh, okay. No, I was talking about myself. Mostly. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> self-editing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that happens. What about you? What did you do this weekend, Matt? Uh, I hawked Girl Scout cookies. I have to do that next week. They were out in force, <laughs> man. Yeah. Every corner, every store. Yeah. they w- That was the right crowd at the uh, Emerald City Comic Con here I'm in like, Seattle. I'm sorry. Oh, I can't buy done. any more what cookies. I can't buy any more cookies. What were we thinking at a grocery store when yeah. we could have been at a Comic Con? Comic Con. Yes. You know, you know, got to go next. They were there. They were all over the place at the Comic Con. Wow. Yeah. And they yeah, must under have made piles a of money. Yeah. Yeah. They just sleep there. With yeah. their big, wide eyes. Yeah. Purchase our delicious cookies yeah. as you as as you play your games. Get and fat on us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we got a lot of fun uh, stuff coming uh, this week for uh, Dungeons and Dragons news, both here um, uh, on uh, the channel as well as just happening out in the world. Uh, so we got nominated for a couple of uh, uh, Golden Geek Awards. Did you guys see this? Yeah, uh, board I game saw geek. Tweet about it. Yeah, uh, best artwork and presentation, uh, as well as best supplement for Xanathar's Guide, uh, and then best supplement also for Tales from the Yawning Portal. And did you guys know that we uh, got nominated for best podcast? Dragon yeah. Talk did. Yes, we did. Which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, mostly, d- I think, to do with you guys and Shelly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys, you're, you're holding the tent well, aloft. You got tons of cool guests coming on. What are you talking about? It's, yeah. yeah. I, I like that you said it was the guest and not, not anything I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> you got them on. <laughs> it's true. All right. I, I, I book it. Uh, maybe that makes this, may, makes something happen. Uh, so that's really awesome. We can't wait to uh, 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 see us be mentioned in that same group. It's, it's just it's an honor to be nominated, as they say. Uh, did you guys watch the Oscars last night by any chance? I, I lived through it vicariously via Twitter. That's kind of the same thing I, nowadays. I, I checked in on Twitter and checked right out when it was all Oscars everything all the time. I was yeah. like, eh. No, not gonna do it. Yeah, your 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 choice of the Grandpa uh, Simpson <laughs> GIF <Yes>. was apt. <laughs> Thrilled that Jordan Peele won for best original yeah. screenplay. Yep. Little sad that Get Out didn't win for best picture, but you know. Yeah, but then we got Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, uh, but uh, fish fucking's in, so. <laughs> 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 and that opens up the door for everything. Oh. It's wide open oh. in many ways <laughs> now. The door is firmly shut. <laughs> Uh, but what I liked what he said too. Or it was like yeah. uh, uh, now genre films are yeah. you know get used to using them as a way to tell about the truth of yes. today. So the best joke I heard on Twitter was uh, when somebody shouted, "Grinding Nemo won." Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
I need to see this movie uh, so yeah, badly uh, uh, <laughs> for, for, for all of these reasons. Um, so this is probably the best segue ever, but Lever- Neverwinter Lost City of Omu is now out uh, uh, in on PC. Uh, super excited to see that conclusion of the Neverwinter uh, uh, arc of Tomb of Annihilation uh, conclude itself. I go through and play with it now. Uh, PS4 and Xbox One will be coming later. Uh, we've also been talking a lot about Morningkanen's Tome of Foes, mm-hmm. uh, which is coming out May 29th. And that's why right, we're talking about Shattered Kai and the Raven Queen. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's a great way to uh, uh, get a little little tidbits, but you'll get more of that lore in that book itself, mm-hmm. which will be fantabulous. Uh, it comes with a uh, alternate cover uh, similar to Volo's Guide and Xanathar's. Um, that is available on May 18th. Uh, the cover artist there is Vance Kelly. It looks super awesome. That's why we're using that artwork for a lot of our uh, um, promotions. Yeah, I guess that's the way to, way to call it. It's on Twitter. It's on here on the on the uh, the channel itself. So if you like that blue and gold kind of aesthetic, uh, jump into your local game store and uh, make sure they order enough of them and uh, get that uh, special cover. And again, it's out uh, before. Uh, it is out available everywhere else. So that's May 18th. Mark your calendars, friends. Uh, Warriors of Waterdeep is coming from a company called Ludia. That is a uh, free-to-play turn-based game on iOS and Android set in the city of Waterdeep. You'll be able to complete tasks for uh, the open lord, Laryl Silverhand, as well as some other great named characters in the city itself, like Mert the Moneylender and uh, Durnan uh, uh, from the Yawning Portal, which is pretty cool. Durnan or Durnan? I feel like you said it was both are okay. Yeah, tomato of mile. I like tomato. <laughs> And getting everyone's name right when we introduce them on the thing. Uh, so we, we talked about, we'll talk more about D&D Beyond uh, in the interview at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time today. Uh, but they have an alpha for their mobile app right now. You can sign up to be a stress tester uh, on iOS and Android. Uh, there are some links that we might throw into the chat for you to go do that now. Uh, but they've got lots of great things coming down, including an improved character sheet layout. Um, they also now incorporate Unearthed Arcana. Uh, articles and, and material in there for ease of playtesting is all marked as unofficial, uh, so you won't get confused. And that is uh, relevant because the Blood Hunter class is in there as well uh, from our friend Matt Mercer. Uh, unofficial, but you can still use it as a way to build your character in the app itself, which is super cool. Um, on to what's happening this week. Uh, uh, we had craft tags today. Uh, we're doing uh, this here fun dragon talk and then loading ready run. Uh, we've been hosting them. They are doing a show called Dice Friends uh, that starts at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We're hosting them. They're awesome. Uh, actually, when I was away in uh, the San Juan mm-hmm. Islands, I was uh, stone's throw. Well, actually, not a stone, like many miles of stone's throw away from <laughs> Victoria. <laughs> throw. Yeah. yeah, several, several million if you, you know, using D&D rules um, to get across there. So it was very cool. Uh, that's where they're broadcasting from uh, starting at 5 p.m. Pacific time today. And then, uh, I didn't know they were out of Victoria. Yeah, cool. isn't, isn't that cool? Um, Tuesday, we got Mike Merle's Happy Fun Hour. He's uh, developing ca- character classes and subclasses. Uh, they're live for you all to see, kind of removing some of the uh, mystery uh, away from what goes into uh, designing classes and things like that. Uh, Dragon Plus is starting at 2 p.m. Pacific time with campaign building. We have some cool guests there, Holly Conrad and Sam Weigert. That's not Sam from Critical Role, is it? No. Weigelt. My bad. I'm very bad at pronouncing names. <laughs> uh, it, it, I need to get better. Uh, then I'll be doing D&D News before Dice Camera Action starts up at 4 p.m. Pacific time. we got Rachel Seeley coming back. That's right. Uh, when is she going to be a full-time cast member? When is that going to mm. happen? <laughs> it's shaping up that way, isn't That's it? That's right. It's been like seven. Yeah. yeah. They just love her so much. Yep. They do. Yeah. Well, and now that Poulton is uh, uh, is going to die uh, or maybe <laughs> be killed uh, by the rest of the party. Well, your crystal ball is better than mine. <laughs> I have no idea how that's going to play out. I just keep bumping things up to you so that you can yeah. be like, no, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Nothing's ridiculous at this point. <laughs> it can all get crazy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, I hope he doesn't. I, that, I think we all do. I think we all, no one wants it to happen, but he might be forcing the hand. That, I got plans for him in season four, so. <laughs> well, maybe we'll just resurrect him then. Mm-hmm. That, that'll be what happens. Uh, and then uh, this is really exciting. Uh, 6.30 p.m., uh, Miss Clicks, Lost Mine, 
Uh, Dungeon Master Anna Prosser Robinson is continuing uh, yes. with uh, with what she's doing. The power has gone to her head. Exactly. Yes. Testing it all out. Uh, and so I'm so excited to see because we also have uh, uh, later on on Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, we have Holly Conrad also Dungeon Mastering in her new show called Trapped in the Birdcage. It is set in the city of Doors, uh, Sigil uh, in uh, uh, Planescape where uh, Strix is from. Uh, and it's super exciting. I just love the bringing. Uh, I, I feel like you're infecting more and more people to to take up the dungeon master mantle. Yeah, infecting. Infecting. <laughs> <laughs> Bad connotations yeah, okay. of that word. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. I'm, I'm, whatever. <laughs> it works. Uh, Happy so to cool. Help. Go check uh, that out uh, again. That's 5 p.m. Pacific time on Thursday uh, for when uh, uh, Holly is doing her game. And uh, by the uh, way, dandy is not a disease; it's the cure. It's the cure. Yeah, yeah that's right. So what? What's how do you disseminate the cure? There's a how do you, the 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 synonym for infecting for that orbital bombardment. <laughs> <laughs> that also sounds bad, Chris. <laughs> oh, Through love. That's right. We're 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 in. Well, but that also then makes it sound dirty. <laughs> we're inserting our love in, oh, of yeah, no, into D and D. No, no, back uh, away. We do not insert our love. <laughs> back away. <laughs> yeah. I'm screwing everything up, guys. All right, so that means we should get right to the lore where uh, we, we it's, it's very impossible for me to screw things up because you guys are the ones who are talking and not mm. me. All right, so uh, Asking you guys are probing all... probing questions. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I like to get right to the to the middle of things. Oh God! <laughs> uh, all right, so are you guys all ready to start recording yeah. over there, Ryan? There I go. hear the clicks. I hear the clicks. Uh, all right, good. Uh, we're gonna start with Shadow Kai first. I know, right now, this yeah. is this is for reals now. That's right. Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know, where we talk about little bits of Dungeons & Dragons lore that you can uh, use in your game or just for your own fun and uh, edification. I am here, I'm Greg Tito, and I'm here with uh, Matt Cernan. Hello. And Chris Perkins. Howdy. Lore Masters extraordinaire, and today we're going to talk about Shatterkai. Oh, yes. You have to say it with that. Shatterkai. Shatterkai. Uh, where you guys mentioned uh, uh, before in our intro that you guys were actually what? around when these were yeah. created. Mm -hmm. Just to go into a little bit of a Wayback Machine. Yeah. So um, people probably know by now that the Githyanki and the Drow first appeared in the Fiend Folio. I mean, they had appeared in Adventures and things before that, but they basically made their first appearance in the first edition Fiend Folio, and that's where people knew you know they could use them in their adventures and everything like that. Um, both wonderful evil races. Well... Third edition comes along many years later, and the decision to release a new Fiend Folio is made. And as part of that decision, the powers that be, um, including, I think, creative director at the time, Ed Stark, set before the writers of that book a monumental task, mm. which was to sprinkle into the book third edition's answer to or equivalent to first edition's Drow in Githyanki. Mm. They wanted, they gave writers, and like the original Fiend Folio, there were a bunch of writers on the book, mm -hmm. this task of coming up with new races, new monstrous races that will have, that could have a legacy going forward that will resonate with D&D audiences. That is a huge thing to try to do. Yeah. Um, terrifying, actually. It was terrifying when you received yes. that assignment? Well, I didn't, but oh. I know the people who I did. did. You <laughs> did? <laughs> was it terrifying for you, yeah. Matt? No, it was exciting. I mean, it was it was a fun thing to, to try to attempt to do, and, um, you know, everybody had uh, their own angle on it, uh, and it, it turns out that the Shatterkai, I think, is the most successful version of it. Yeah. Um, there were other others that, for various reasons, didn't catch on. Um, the Ether Gaunts, spring to mind. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Eric Mona tackled those. That and, sounds correct. And they're, they're actually really neat, but I think their downfall was, you know, it's a race that lives in the ethereal plane. Nobody ever goes there. <laughs> or can so, live there. Right. Right. So right. hence, yeah. no adventures yeah. ever feature the Aether Gaunts in, ever. Um, and so I don't think they gained much traction. My, my version of it was the Mog, um, which uh, I... It, I don't even remember what the heck they did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were big stone people. Yeah, yeah, but the the process of it was weird because you know we had this this uh, go and forth and make the these drow and githyanki. Yeah, and then during the development process of the book, um, the the sort of mission statement changed to make it something that can be played as a player character. So I had designed the mog to be these these sort of like mythic force and these powerful beings and you know, this race of 
I don't know, something or other, blah, 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 forgotten something, something. And <laughs> uh, and they were t- turned into um, basically a, a player character race and sort of shrunk down into fit, which is very strange because they were still like large creatures. And we, at the time, it was very edition, hard to yeah, do. It wasn't, so it was a bizarre like mix up and and yeah, I, interesting. I, I don't know that everyone's version of the Githyanki or Drow yeah. got into the book even. But uh, Jesse Decker was the designer of the Shatterkai. Okay. Right. And why do you think they resonated? Uh, I think part of it was um, they were human like, mm-hmm. and that's always a, that's always a draw for people. Mm-hmm. They can relate to it better. The Fey angle I thought w- probably served them well. There's always been an attraction to fey creatures. Um, I think those two things helped. He also built into their design this idea that they wield some new weird weapons Mm -hmm. that we had never seen before. And so they had toys to play with. So I think that was part of their success. Now, and we can go into this further, but I don't think there's been any race that has been more sort of twisted around and repurposed than the Shatterkai over editions. Okay. they where, actually, where did they start from? Yeah, they start. They started as these fey beings with these this affinity for weird shadowfell magic. But and they were then, they were on the material plane though. No, uh, so they they wanted to use the uh, magic of the plane of shadow um, to sort of uh, stop mortals from gaining power and so on. And then they ended up getting trapped in the shadowfell. And uh, there was an interesting story with them where they were this sort of like disappearing people, where they were kind of like evaporating back into this shadow fell unless they kind of anchored themselves. Right. So they had these sort of weird um, armbands they would put on that would kind of like pierce their flesh with you know, like iron yes. and, uh, and and that kind of would help anchor them. And then there's this idea of like um, passions or pains or emotions and so on kind of like, like anchoring them in place because um, otherwise they just kind of fade into the into the shadow fell. Shadow fell. Into the somber despair of the okay. shadow fell. Now were Plain they the were time. they uh, they were elves to start or were they humans they were, to start they or were, did it matter? They were elfin, elf like yeah. fae. They were kind of they were their own kind of fae. fae Interesting. people. Okay. They were sort of a halfway between human and full on elves, I think, in terms of their concept. Uh, and then fourth edition comes along and we make them full out humans. Okay. Uh, we decided that their Basically, they're humans who got pulled into the Shadowfell, became uh, sort of lost or became numb while there. The despair sort of got to them, so they became sort of very bleak and nihilistic. And the only way that they could really sort of feel alive was to inflict pain on themselves. So they had weird piercings, and they would disfigure their own flesh and do other crazy masochistic things just to kind of feel alive. Interesting. And so they became this sort of very bleak, uh, despairing human folk who built cities in the Shadowfell. Um, we had a whole product called Shadowfell Gloomrot and Beyond, which detailed a Shatterkai city of Gloomrot and its occupants. Um, now, what, how did, what was the story of how they ended up in the Shadowfell? Were they, was it a group of humans or was it just home humans over time migrated so the, there? The story kind of developed over the process of, of the edition. Uh-huh. So in the original um, 4E Monster Manual, it's pretty thin, right? Yeah. It, just, it just talks about them serving the Raven Queen and, um, you know, they... Who we will get to on another segment yes. of Lore You Should Know. They live in the, the Shadowfell and they, they, they do stuff there. And um, then later products kind of added more and more sort of mythic history to the Shatter Kai, and they became these people who actually sought out the Raven Queen in order to protect them from um, death and life's ailments and stuff like that. And they became sort of people who were trapped in, or not necessarily trapped, but like they attuned to the Shadowfell in the service of the Raven Queen. Okay. Yeah. Can they... And then reproduce in like so it went, now that they're all there, then they they you, there's children and yeah. things that like you know yeah. it is a whole working civilization right. yes. in yes. the Shadowfell. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, that's interesting. A very sort of depressing, depressing, gray, bleak kind of existence. Interesting. And in and in third edition, they didn't get Shatterkai get, didn't get used a whole lot. Uh, mm-hmm. They got um, yeah. touched upon with Forgotten Realms because the. Uh, the Netherese come back, and they come back as these shadow people. Mm-hmm. And so there was sort of a natural association. Oh, well, what's the other shadow people that we can put with them? And so then they kind of got in, – in certain places, they are also Netherese, or the Netherese become Shatterkai, or 
or the Shadokai are just like mercenaries that they hire. It's kind of it's wibbly wobbly, um, but they get associated with uh, sort of other people that are from the Shadowfell. Yeah. Uh, and then in fourth, um, that kind of association thing continues. And again, it's it's this weird process where like it got sort of added to lore wise as, already existed. as the edition went right. on. Yeah. yeah. And Shadow Kai was a, a character option, fully fleshed out character option in fourth edition. We had a, an adventure path in fourth edition that focused on Orcus and the Raven Queen, so Shadow Kai played prominent roles there. Mm -hmm. um, they did get used a lot in fourth edition, mm -hmm. more so than in third. Um, What's the connection with the uh, with Orcus? Um, so in fourth edition, and we can talk about this maybe more when we talk about the Raven Queen. Mm -hmm. Is Orcus was trying to basically seize the Raven Queen's mantle of death? Oh, I see. Because there, there's some overlap there. He's the he's the demon prince of undeath. She's the goddess of death. They were sort of in in opposing corners of a co of a multiversal conflict. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. That makes sense. Uh, both of them will be talked about in Morning Cannon's Tome of Foes, uh, uh, yes. incidentally enough, yes. uh, which is is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so, what uh, I, I guess we mentioned a lot about like where they were created and where they came from, but like what what is our uh, kind of conception of them now in, in Fifth Edition? Well, so with the process of Morgan Cannon's Tome of Foes, we wanted to kind of um, bring them back into the fold of the normal uh, sort of cosmology of the world and then also touch perhaps a little more on their original origin story and stuff like that. So part of the problem with um, their ties to the Raven Queen and the Shadowfell as it was presented in 4th edition is 4th edition basically used an entirely different cosmology and so um, you know and it assumed lots of different things about gods and all this kind of stuff and it got really confusing. So for example you know there's the idea in, in, throughout much of 4th edition that Shar is, the, is in control of the Plane of Shadow but fourth edition also says the Raven Queen is in control of the Plane of Shadow. Mm -hmm. So like what? Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so we wanted to kind of um, bring Are you the same person. Yeah, this the same kind entity? of stuff back and give her a mythic root. One of the things the fourth edition did as well is I think it was uh, Open Grave, but it might have been a different supplement. Um, it tells the origin story of uh, the Raven Queen, and um, so with Morgan Cain's Tome of Foes. We want to change that origin story because that origin story is a little bit weird. Basically, she dies and Nero likes her and makes her his wife. Right. And, and well, what about the Shatterkai? What, what, what's the conception of them? So they're they're basically just these sort of adherents of the Raven Queen in fourth edition, and so they they they, they didn't really have any sort of interesting mythic origin or anything like that. They mm -hmm. didn't sort of have their own story other than like, hey, the Raven Queen's great and we don't want to die. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so we we went back to kind of um, some fundamental principles with all these things and kind of wove the two stories together in a really interesting way, I think. Cool. Um, if people were interested in playing a, a, a player character that's Shatter Kai, uh, what uh, what You'll be able to do so when Morden Cannon's Tome of Foes comes out. Oh, well, that's we cool. give you the options to create Shatter Kai characters. What uh, if, if you were going to give someone the uh, uh, you know the, the the quick version of, of of what that means? Like, what does it mean to be a, 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 an a adherent to and also uh, part of that race? <clears throat> it means that you've got sort of the plane of shadow in your essence, mm. uh, and so you can do shadowy things. Um, you're a shadowy person. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't want to give too much away because yeah. you know spoil the surprise, but. Your, you, your powers, first of all, you're, you're like an elf um, in a lot of ways, uh, but you've got these additional sort of layer of sort of shadow-themed powers. I see. So you'd be like a goth elf. A little bit. Yeah, it, it's a good race to play if you've got the goth in you. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Um, you mentioned the weapons uh, that they brought to the table first for third edition. Is that uh, Follow through? Mm, no, not so much. Well, um, what were some of those weapons? Just so it, maybe uh, there, there's something see. that might, might. I don't the remember, but Matt will. Gull <laughs> Rolan. That's, the, right. that's the iron armband thing. Um, oh, the thing that uh, yeah, uh, yeah, anchors them. Anchors uh, them and holds them in place. Blackstone Rune. Uh, they have something called Night Extract. Night Extract? What's um, that? They, they like to. They're depicted wielding like a, um, a chain with blades on it. And yeah. so there's lots of sort of like, you know. Pain weapons. Yeah, uh, yeah. They don't <laughs> and just that's, kill you. That's they something <laughs> that was preserved in fourth edition. We had them wheeling spike chains all the time in fourth edition. Yeah, yeah. things that cause cause pain, not just yeah. not just death and dismemberment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but worse. 
uh, interesting. So they, they definitely have this this relationship with uh, the, the dark side of the psyche. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. And just the, the inevitability of time and death is forever haunting them. Right. Uh, philosophically, are, are the Shatterkai uh, still nihilistic? Are they still... Uh, I think that we're... I don't think we want to paint them in that narrow of a corner. I, I imagine a lot of them are. Mm-hmm. But they all have their own reasons for living. Are they inherently evil? Are they good? Or, you know, how does, how does that work? Well, that's a good question. Um, the Raven Queen is not inherently evil. Right. Uh, the shadow, Plane of Shadow is not inherently evil. And like all of our races, there are representatives across the entire spectrum of alignments. So I would say no, they're not. Um, they can be. Yeah. Interesting. I, I think with our new sort of mythic history and their relation to the Raven Queen as we see her now, um, they are uh, definitely figures of mystery and um, who have sort of their own uh, bent on sort of what they view as their role in life and reality and stuff like that. And so it's a very it's a very unique story. I don't want to spoil it because it's, yeah. it's really it's quite a, quite a lot of fun. In my uh, reading of Morden Cannon's Right Before I Went Out the Door, I was so kind of inspired by the Shatterkai entry that I injected two of them into my Dice Camera action campaign. <laughs> um, and the characters are dealing with that right now. Ah, so that makes even more yeah. sense. Now, they speak Italian in my campaign, <laughs> which is not canonical. <laughs> That's not in the book? No, no, no. <laughs> Um, and that's just me riffing off my, my habit of giving different elf subraces, different European languages. The drow in my campaign are typically French, by the way. Uh, so, um, but and, and you get to wield those accents. It's been fun. It's been fun, like dropping little tiny itty bitty t- bits of sort of shatter kindness into the campaign. Yeah. Um, and I know there's going to be lots of shatter characters running around after the book releases. If people were more, uh, uh, inspired to kind of pick this up when it comes out, uh, what, what are some other think ideas or, or, or plot hooks or things like that that you might throw at, at, at people, not to give too much away. Well, one of the things that Chatterkai do is they, uh, to sort of serve their queen and to kind of live vicariously through the emotional attachments of others, they collect trinkets and memories. Mm. Um, and so that could be something that you could do as a Shatterkai character is when you find something even if it's a fairly innocuous item, you want to hear the story of who had that item and why and kind of share in that memory and have that uh, item with you. Um, so uh, I think there's an interesting connection between Shatterkai and trinkets that, that could be played with. Oh, yeah. I love um, the trinket tables yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that we've been doing yeah. for so many of our supplements. So yes, they would they would be able to roll quite a few times mm-hmm. on that table. Yep. Like, that makes sense. Are they hoarders, or is it more no. of a, just like a, a, this 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 object has an interesting story to tell? They're, they're sort of looking for connections to things that are, that have great destiny or potential, um, whatever they happen to be. And they may glom onto individuals the same way. Mm. You know, this person is a person of destiny. I'm gonna hang out with them for a while. I'm gonna send little notes back to the Raven Queen about how that person's doing. And why they should collect that soul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, in uh, my campaign, another thing I did was, because um, there's a lot of Ravenloft stuff in my campaign, and Ravenloft has these things called Dusk Elves, I basically mm-hmm. decided that Dusk Elf was just another name for Shatterkai, and that the two were essentially the same thing. Yeah, I was going to ask, so. uh, how, how does that relate to the, the, the demiplane of, of, of Ravenloft? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. There's lots of crossover between well, yeah, those two. Well, yeah, because we say that the Shadowfell is where domains of dread are born, and Shatterkai inhabit the Shadowfell. It stands to reason that they, they're they prone to encounter or or have run-ins with creatures around a demiplane or in a demiplane. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I brought it up earlier a little bit, but I think in, in 5th edition, we don't really ever assume that there's... Um, with the exception, I, I guess, maybe of the Nine Hells, that uh, that's, there's one entity in control of an entire plane. Right, right. So, you know, the idea that Shar controls the Shadowfell or that the Raven Queen controls the Shadowfell, that's that's just not something we really think about anymore. Now, they, I mean, they have, obviously, maybe their areas of control. or I, influence. the DM, control the Shadowfell <laughs> but, yeah. in my own campaign. <laughs> but we... We don't, yeah. There isn't like one person so, sort of right. like in charge. Yeah, that that idea yeah. of there was like one settlement on this plane, and that is where everything you know all goes to that. Uh, is, yeah, yeah, is, isn't quite as true anymore. Yeah, that's interesting too because that means there's lots of plays to play. There's lots of interesting yep. ways for the dungeon master yep. to use all this. Yeah, cool beans. 
All right. All right. Any other, uh, uh, if you want to get in touch with you, Mr. Perkins, about ask you about uh, uh, why Shatter Kai are Italian. I am on Twitter at Chris Perkins DND. Excellent. And you, Matt Cernet. Um, I'm on Twitter at Cernet, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. Awesome. All right, great. Thank you guys so much. We'll be back with another uh, segment next week. Or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> I didn't want to delve too much into the Raven Queen. It was always hard. To yeah, be yeah, yeah. They, they become entwined. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, but let's do our let's do everything we can get across about the Raven Queen because this is a big. Uh, I, I don't know much about her. She is uh, fantastic. Yeah. So this is this is me jumping into it. Yeah. I always think of. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, Matt or or Marisha uh, did a uh, picture from. What's the Burning Man yeah. thing? And there was a huge life size, lot more bigger than life size Raven uh, uh, there that I thought was uh, this is pretty much whatever I think of when people mm. say the Raven Queen. Yep. I think of this amazingly yes. detailed sculpture of a huge. We would be remiss if we didn't mention the Raven Queen in, ter- in the context of critical role, since she does play a pr- play. She played a prominent role in the last campaign. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, cool. How are you guys in chat doing? Huh? I think Dusk Elves are Barovia. Yes, they are. It's true. Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by these amazing lore masters, Mr. Matt Cernet. Howdy. And Chris Perkins. Greetings. And today on this segment, where we talk about little bits of Dungeons & Dragons lore for use in your campaign or just for your fun knowledge, uh, today we're going to talk about the Raven Queen and where she was conceived and and thought of uh, here in this building and and then where she has gone from there. So She was conceived in Graceland. Really? Strangely enough, yes. In the actual no. house? She was conceived in a meeting room in Watsi ah. called Graceland. Right, which was so. then called House on the Hill. So she was born in the house of the king, <laughs> this raven queen. <laughs> See, now, <laughs> now I want to know that you guys like took a road trip to Memphis, Tennessee, and were like, uh, let's just do let's some brainstorm. Let's make a god. Yeah. <laughs> she was also partially conceived over email. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in the aether, she yeah. was also uh, uh, made up. Uh, right. So uh, she is a she is a product of fourth edition that mm-hmm. has survived uh, thereafter. Um, so what happened is when fourth edition was being reborn, two teams were created by Bill Slavasek, one to tackle rules and one to tackle world building. And Rich Baker, one of our senior designers at the time, was in charge of the world building team. And he got a bunch of people in a room where the task was and. Rich, by the way, he came out of the military and the Navy, so he loved coming up with team names and code words for everything. <laughs> so, like, we were Team Ramjet or Scram- Team... E- Scramjet. 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 I keep thinking of Ramjet, Exploding Rocket, whatever, because Rich had a knack <laughs> for weirdly phallic names. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's, so Scramjet it is. Yeah, uh, Scramjet, right. I don't know why I thought Ramjet. But, um, <laughs> One second. This is... Getting into your psyche on these segments (laughs) has been my favorite thing ever. I have to say, um, (laughs) first of all, I I don't mean to make fun of Rich Baker. Rich Baker is a phenomenal designer and a hell of a nice person. Um, uh, But he does have a thing with names. Like, he's he's the guy who would come to the table with a character named Jizz Hornswallow or (laughs) uh, Service Longstaff and be sort of sheepishly quiet as everyone around the table was laughing like he didn't really understand what was going on it was so much so funny he's 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 just got, sort of got a blind spot for some of these weird names um, <laughs> anyway scramjet yes we were all in a room coming up with a pantheon of deities and uh, to basically serve as the default fourth edition pantheon like if you didn't have a pantheon of deities for your world mm-hmm. use this and then the points of light setting which was sort of the default the narath setting uh, for right. fourth edition, for, for would also vale. use yeah. by way of example this. Incidentally, a little side note about Nenter Vale. Originally, it was Rich wrote that uh, for the Forgotten Realms. Like he carved out a section of the Forgotten Realms. Oh, and that was going to be what the setting was before the decision was made not to use the Forgotten Realms as the default fourth edition setting. Oh, interesting. So he basically, rather than rewrite everything, he took that material which I believe was based in the realm of Hearts Vale, and then renamed everything on the map to genericize it. Oh, uh, interesting. And uh, so, so what adventure was it that, that used an FR map as 
for the it was the the one with the hobgoblins and so on. Which one was that? Oh, um, num, num, num. Red Hand. Uh, Red Hand of Doom. Red Hand of Doom. Yes. That's that's a sort of generic adventure that's also set in forgotten realms that Rich did. But yeah, yeah. But then got moved over, right? Okay. Yeah, then got genericized. Okay. Uh, so, so so this was the goal yeah. was to in everybody in this yes. team to create this, create pantheon, this pantheon and it pulled from various it sources. Pulled, yeah. So we had Asmodeus as the god of tyranny, and we had Bahamut as the god of justice, and we had Ayun as the god of knowledge. Uh, before that, she was just a stone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not entirely true, but whatever. No, right. I know. <laughs> she was known for being a, basically a collection of floating stones that circled your head. Yeah, um, very overpowered. Uh, and then uh, when uh, it came to find out, when it came to identify who was going to be the god of death, this figure called the Raven Queen emerged. And I don't remember if we gave her a name or whatever. I think James may have James so, Wyatt may have been the first person to propose the name. So what happened? Because uh, I tracked I tracked down James this morning and asked him about this. Oops. Oh, cool. And so the way that it worked out was that um, the Raven Queen had uh, a number of different names beforehand, um, and I'm not going to say them because they might be her secret real name, which we've never revealed. Ah. But, but this is Laura, we should know, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> this is, but there were three other names that we had before the Raven Queen. And at some point, while people were, were in a meeting um, writing just names of, of gods on the board, uh, Chris Perkins wrote Raven uh, uh, as one of the options. And James said that you know he didn't really like Raven alone as a name, but if we called it Raven Queen as a sort of appellation, and then like maybe people are afraid to to say the name, mm-hmm. and so there was another meeting I think with uh, I think James said it was Chris and Stacy and uh, I don't know if it was Bill Slavisak or Ed Stark, but um, the that group then decided like that's it, it's the Raven Queen, and you know people are afraid of saying or or don't know you know her real name. Yeah, she whom shall not be named, mm-hmm. but that right. became. Instead she of whose short. name is forgotten. She yeah. whose name is guarded. Yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. Uh, and I like that, too, because it does immediately have mystery. You don't know what it's all, you know, uh, so many of these names are hard to pronounce. People don't really understand it. But, like, this was immediately evocative. Yeah. And, you know, she was um, designed as sort of the, the goddess of death, but then she kind of got um, – Winter and fate uh, sort of attached to that as well, mm-hmm. um, because a, a, a lot of what the fourth edition sort of pantheon was doing was kind of taking all these thousands and thousands of gods that have been done for D and D over the year, ages and trying to be like, no, no, let's just clean it up. We'll make it, you know, a few things that Super people tight. remember, yeah. and so on. And so uh, some of them, like Ayun and Melora, and a couple of other ones that were new, uh, you know, didn't really. I don't think catch on as much as the Raven Queen because the Raven Queen has a cool name, <laughs> and Very and much. you know is as you know it does interesting stuff and you know who is this this interesting you know mysterious uh, neutral god of death and yeah. winter and all this kind of thing. So it, how much was pulled from Wee Joss, uh, the 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 goddess of death and in Greyhawk? Was that very little? Very little, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even think it came up in conversation. Interesting. I think there was there was discussion at some point early on of like, can we use Wee Joss uh, or not? But then it was basically no, because Wee Joss doesn't do all these other things that we want this right. character to do. Got it. So yeah. All right. So then, what uh, what what is the conception of the Raven Queen uh, from from fourth? And then, yeah, we'll talk more about how it might relate to uh, uh, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. So I don't remember the occasion that led us to actually sit down and brainstorm what she looked like. But ultimately, I know design wise, we settled on a beautiful sort of alabaster skinned, raven haired woman with big feathered black wings. Um, that's kind of low hanging fruit mm-hmm. <laughs> to some extent. Yeah, uh, <laughs> she's the Raven Queen. Right, she looks like yeah, the Raven Queen. You know, for for all, any misgivings we may have had about her appearance, she sure spawned a lot of uh, fan art. Mm. Um, so, um, th- there was relatively little written about her in uh, early on, yeah. and then um, there was this idea that she had uh, some sort of palace in the Shadowfell, um, and it was called Litherna. Mm-hmm. Um, it was this black ice palace um, in Ooh. sort of this icy mountainous mm-hmm. region. Uh, and then I think it was Open Grave, but it might have been another product. Um, there was finally a, an actual backstory that was given that was uh, she, Neryl was the god of death, um, and uh, he basically took all the souls. And one day, uh, this awesome lady dies and he's like hey she's really keen 
and he, I'll he, keep that one. Yep. Mm-hmm. He he takes her as his consort, and then she learns from him and becomes so badass that she kills him, and takes his stuff. Uh, takes his stuff, and then becomes a god. And then all the uh, this is like sort of all posed to be in kind of like this hazy way back time. Mm. Um, and all the other gods are like, hey, wait a minute, that's that's unusual. Did you see what she did? <laughs> you, you just, just can't do that. You can't just kill gods. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so, like, I, I forget whether she decided to leave the astral or she just was like, fine, I'm taking my ball and going home and went. <laughs> 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 but she goes to the Shadowfell, basically, because all in, in the fourth edition cosmology, basically all the other deities are on the astral plane, mm-hmm. which is a, a sort of attached and has these m- oh, mini realms of other planes within it. Uh, and so she's the only sort of god that's kind of on the outside. Uh, well, other than Asmodeus, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And so, like... She's got the domains of, 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 of death, so she deals with souls and right. everyone who yes. passes yeah. into yeah. the afterlife. And also she's a, she's a champion against uh, undeath, and the Shadowfell oh. is often full of undead creatures. So she kind of went down there to kind of get that under control. Why yeah. is she against undeath? Because it's a perversion. Um, you're basically imbuing evil souls in the bodies of dead flesh when those souls should be allowed to continue on to whatever hellish afterlife they're destined for. Yeah. And because she's neutral, she's all about the balance. Right, yeah. And at some point she kills some, or gets the power of some deity of winter. I th- might have been Kala. I might, I might be wrong. Uh, and then she also... Um, Did she do the same thing? Like interferes. Kill, kill her and take her portfolio, essentially? Yeah. She interferes somehow with like the, the fight between Lolth and um, Coralon and then gets fate from Lolth. And that's the fourth edition version of um, of hers. That's how she got sort yeah. of death, winter, and fate. Yeah. Now, some, now a, a fragment of that survives in the current incarnation of the Raven Queen. Oh, okay. Because... Uh, as you'll learn when you uh, pick up Mordenkainen's, the idea that there, we, we posit the idea that she was long ago an elf queen who saw an opportunity to try to unite the elves after the fracture of good elves and dark elves. Mm-hmm. Um, but things don't go as she plans. Um, there's some meddling in her plans. And uh, when things go haywire and she does not succeed in uh, stitching the elves back together as one unified people, that's when sort of the Raven Queen persona is born. Interesting. All right. And what, what, what was she always um, had an affinity for ravens? Like, wh- where did that name come from other than having wings and things like that? But I assume that must have come in after that. Uh, On a mythic level, there's this idea that ravens are like the protectors of the souls of the dead, that they sort of guide the souls to where they need to go. And this is a myth that is peppered throughout different earth cultures, um, uh, that birds as guiding spirits. Uh, But also ravens are known for being attracted to shiny objects and hoarding them and keeping them in their nests and things like that. So the idea that she has those qualities, Mm -hmm. she is both a shepherd of souls in a way, but she's also a collector of interesting things in this case uh (laughs) she's a collector of destinies and fates that are interesting uh people who were were on a path that was important somehow uh, as she was uh these are the things that sort of grab her interest and she's always sort of reaching out to try to take hold of them protectively on some level but also just out of interest Mm. it's a shiny thing that has caught her eye and she wants to explore it further. There was a joke around the office during the writing of this that she's, she's like a, an avid TV watcher um, that she like is just channel surfing and to try to find the coolest show. And once she finds it, she becomes embroiled in the soap opera of it all and becomes interested in those lives. Mm. And she wants to follow them till their, till their natural end. And so she uses agents to spy on these interesting characters out in the multiverse to keep her uh, abreast of all the information uh, that they have. They, you know, have to communicate with her through various means and send her thing reports and things like that. And so she's just paying attention to people whose fates are of consequence. Yeah, and there's there's sort of an idea that, that you know, sometimes she might sort of 
get bored, mm-hmm. and 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 so sh- she sort of, um, you know, d- just ch- changes the channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, and, yeah, right. And, and, and suddenly you are no longer of interest <laughs> to her. <laughs> and then the, also the idea that she might uh, kind of collect some of these things and, and be a, a bit sort of obsessive compulsive about. And you mentioned hoarding, I think, in the last discussion. Yeah. Like the idea that she. Like in her palace of of I forget what we call it exactly uh, black eyes, but it's it's not Lathurna anymore. It's something else, but like that's a place where you would find uh, memories and dreams and people and so on that she's collected over time oh, that she was interested in. Yes. but then she's just kind of lost interest, and they're still there, just kind of trapped. Yeah, in this sort of. And mm-hmm. some of them might be yours. Cycle. Like she may have stolen a memory of your grandfather when you were a child. Mm. And you may encounter that memory of your grandfather if you are in her domain or in her palace specifically. Uh, Do you mean in, a, in, a, in an image or would it be yeah. like that, he, he, that he, he would actually be embodied in, in, in her palace? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all, the, all the above. Yeah. yeah. Grand, Grandpa, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm just a memory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a figment of your imagination. Yeah. Uh, but that's it. Okay, I like that. And that, you, I, there's... I, there's no catalog or you know rhyme or reason to mm-hmm. all of these memories or things in there, so th- yeah. that'd be a, a fascinating place yeah. to explore. Yep, yep, yep. Um, now in in dice camera action because I introduced Shatterkind in my campaign recently. I also introduced the Raven Queen recently. Um, Raven Queen also figured prominently in Critical Role. Yes, Matt Mercer had a character, uh, one of the party members, who was a champion of the Raven Queen, and so as that character became as that character's story started to come into focus, the Raven Queen became more and more of a fixture in that campaign. In my campaign, uh, she's, she's sort of pushing a character down a path that he is meant to go. Um, and that's really the extent of her involvement. She doesn't take credit for it, and she doesn't necessarily know how it's going to play out. She's watching TV, like all the other Waffle Fan viewers out there, waiting to see <laughs> what Paulton does with the toys that he's been given. Um, but, but she has certainly sort of put his destiny first and foremost in the Waffle Crew's mind. And now she's interested to see whether it's going to resolve as she thinks it might. Like any good TV viewer, she's got her thoughts about how it all might end. Yeah. She's going to let it play out the way it should. What's interesting about this to me is that, you know, usually when you, when you have a neutral goddess or God, uh, it's very much, and I mentioned balance, you know, before that's why she doesn't like on death, but like. This seems very not like balance. Like she is like, I just want to play with yeah. things. Yeah, sure. uh, might be I, unhinged actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Talk about the idea that she she may have lost a few um, memories and thoughts of her own in her transformation, and and the way she's portrayed in the dice camera action game, she's not even human like. I mean, she's like a walking bird's nest. She's just like this mass of twigs in a vaguely crone like shape. Not the attractive seductress that we've seen in previous editions. Mm. And she is definitely mentally unhinged. She can't she can't finish a sentence pretty much. Um and often she can't speak at all because she's forgotten the words. She uses them so infrequently. Um and so uh, she is a bit of a basket case. Yeah. And it, and obviously dangerous because hey she's a god. Yeah, and I think one of the things um, that comes across too is that um, the I, I think Mike Rolls might have mentioned this in one of his interviews recently with D and D Beyond, but um, you know the the way that people view the gods and you know what's truth and so on it differs but from world to world. So mm-hmm. you know in in some world out there the world of Nerath or whatever. You know what? Uh, Neryl's dead, and the Raven Queens are, are are goddess of death and fate and winter, and that's the, that's the thing. And you know, you go over to Greyhawk, and Neryl's not, not. What do you have? Who's this Raven Queen person, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, uh, and I think that the fifth edition sort of way that we think about the, the sort of multiverse and pantheons and so on, it allows for that multiple world interpretation. You know, Coralon here versus Coralon there. Raven Queen here versus Raven Queen there. There's going to be different interpretations. Yeah, from yeah. Place and, place. and th- your interpretation is different than than Matt's. Than Absolutely different than yes. the way people are going to yeah. uh, introduce them in, into in, their yeah. game. Yeah, in fact, I was very conscious of the like. I knew I was going to introduce the Raven Queen at some point. Yeah. I was very conscious of what Matt was doing and aimed to do something deliberately different, just by illustration show 
that yeah we can call them the same thing but they can have completely different purposes and different place in the in the campaign that's cool all right and i hope people uh, uh take some of what we've talked about here as well as uh, what yeah. you guys are doing on those shows and what's going to come in morning canyon's tomb of foes and, and have their own interpretations exactly yeah if you don't want the raven queen to have anything to do with the shatter kai that's cool there's plenty of else going on with her yeah uh, that you can play with uh, she's just such an interesting concept never mind the specifics just the very concept of her is fascinating to a lot of people Nice. Cool. Well, I hope uh, uh, more people jump in uh, when Morning Canyons comes out on May 29th. Should be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, if people want to ask you any questions about uh, the Raven Quinn or what it was like to be in the room where it happened, uh, how could they get in touch with you? I am on Twitter at Chris Perkins DND. Excellent. And you, Mr. I was going to say Cernit, but it's basically what you're about to say <laughs> <Yes>. anyway. <laughs> At Cernit, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. Awesome. Uh, cool. We'll be back uh, with more Lore You Should Know segments uh, in future podcasts. See you guys soon. Awesome. The uh, the one thing I almost uh, uh, laughed out loud uh, here in Twitch was, I wonder who the Raven Queen is shipping. <laughs> in dice camera action, because uh, <laughs> she, she's a watcher. You, you baby, yes, yeah, yes, she's she's she following is. along just like everyone else is. Yep, uh, Margot Robbie as the Raven Queen. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, I could see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good yeah. idea. I was going to say Helen Mirren, but Margot Robbie. Ooh, fine. gosh. Now I want different versions mm-hmm. <laughs> all in their conception. Yes. All right, cool. Well, thank you guys so much uh, uh, for dropping in, doing some lore you should know with us. Uh, uh, everybody in the chat, thank you for, for being here. Uh, we are going to take a short break, um, get everything set up for our interview uh, with uh, Zalavier Nelson Jr. Uh, and uh, get Shelly in here and make it all worth. Uh, and uh, so in the meantime, you guys will have uh, a few ads to watch, those of you who aren't Twitch s- subscribers. Uh, and if you are, thank you so much for subscribing. You are amazing. All of your support uh, in watching all the programming we have on here is uh, super appreciated, and uh, we love you guys. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, uh, in the meantime, enjoy this uh, little little bit of ads, and uh, we'll be back uh, probably right around uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time uh, with our interview. All right. Thank you, guys. See you later. Bye.